yeah, I will then uh, conclude and give a little bit of a future outlook into my research. Uh, as many of you here probably already know, most black holes in our own galaxies are found in a, a, in a black hole X-ray binaries. In a black hole X-ray binaries, essentially in black hole and star are orbiting each other. This situation can happen when in a stellar binary a very massive star collapses into a black hole. As you see, uh, when the two systems come, when the star and the black hole come together, processes like Rochlow overflow can cause gas from the star to start falling onto this black hole, but because this gas has angular momentum, it first forms an accretion disk, and this accretion disk emits in uh, X-ray for stellar mass black hole, hence they are called X-ray binaries. Uh, we can also look at this process in the form of a numerical simulation. This is a numerical general relativistic MHD simulation in the colors, uh, blue and green, you see density contours of the density in the accretion disk and on the, and all the axes are given in gravitational radii and one gravitational radius is approximately the radius of this rapidly spinning black hole. As I start the simulation, you will immediately see that turbulence develops in this accretion. This is turbulence develops because there are magnetic fields that is the, rot the differential rotation in the disk uh, kind of winds up and destabilizes these magnetic fields, which feeds the turbulence. In addition, when this, when this turbulence develops, this gas starts falling in to the black hole. And while this gas falls in, it drags along with it magnetic fields. And when these magnetic fields start to thread the black hole's event horizon, the spinning of the black hole kind of coils up these magnetic fields, which launches these relativistic jets. And as I will show in later parts of my talk, such jets can become extremely powerful. Besides stellar mass black holes, we also know that black holes can be very massive. For example, we can look at the center of our own galaxy here, you see a global picture, and here you see a zoom in. All of these dots represent stars, and observers have tracked these stars for several decades now, and they orbit this black hole. And just by simple Keplerian dynamics, and you can see that there must be something extremely massive on the order of several million solar masses at the center of our galaxies. This is not the end of the story. The black hole in our own galaxy is not the massive, the most massive that's known to exist. Those exceed more than 10 billion solar masses. I think we're living in an extremely exciting time now regarding black hole physics, because what has been done in the last couple of years, the Event Horizon Telescope, collaboration by the merger of many radio telescopes in the world has managed to build kind of an artificial radio dish approximately the size of the Earth's radius. And they have taken an image of a black hole. Here you see this image, you see this crescent, which is, uh, which is the radiation from the hot plasma around the black hole together with a shadow. And here you see one of my numerical simulations, which uh, includes most of the physics, and this is the highest resolution GRMHC simulation ever. And why do we study these black holes? I think they are very interesting from two perspectives, both for probing general relativity, so answering questions like, are standard black holes real? Do we really understand the physics? But also from the fundamental plasma physics perspective, black holes are very interesting subjects to study because when gas falls into a black hole, lots of gravitation, no potential energy gets converted into other forms of energy like jets, winds, and radiation. And for example, nuclear fusion has like a 1% efficiency with respect to the rest mass energy, while black holes can easily have 20% and in some cases even exceed 100% accretion efficiency. In addition, when these jets get launched, the magnetic energy density is so much higher than the rest mass energy density. When you convert this magnetic energy into the 
respective particles, then you can accelerate such particles, cosmic rays, to extremely high energies that are many orders of magnitude above what can be achieved in the best particle accelerators on Earth. The second reason why we study black holes is not just the fundamental physics. Black holes are also really important in structure formation in our universe. Because these jets are so powerful, when this gas falls in, they also exert feedback through this process called black hole feedback. Here you see again a numerical simulation on the left. I mean, these are density contours. On the left, you see in black magnetic field lines and a low density region, which represents the jet. And then to the right, you see the high density gas, which represents the interstellar and inter clusteral medium. When I start running this simulation, you see that this jet kind of starts to pinch and interact with this boundary of the uh, with this boundary of the interstellar and intergalactic gas. And this is the energy exchange that we think essentially, for example, regulates the growth of galaxies and also star formation and in other contexts, for example, in supernovae and binary mergers, similar processes are occurring. This all makes black hole accretion extremely interesting and really with the fusion of very powerful numerical models with observatories like the EHT, cosmic ray detectors and space-based observatories like JWST. I think we can learn a lot about all of these topics in the coming years and decades. So to model black hole accretion, you need several components. First of all, I've already highlighted it a little bit. You need magnetic fields because the sharing up of magnetic field lines in the disk, which is like illustrated here, sees the turbulence. If there were no magnetic fields, then the disk would accrete or many, many orders of magnitude slower and simply nothing could be explained. And these jets, because these jets are essentially pointing flux bundles also magnetic need these magnetic fields. In addition, an important aspect for some accretion disks is also radiation because radiation cools an accretion disk. When this accretion disk cools, the accretion disk becomes much thinner. Look at it, for example, at the uh, in, in the Earth, the atmosphere is thick, thicker at the equator than at the poles, just because the poles are, uh, sorry, because the uh, equator is hotter than the poles. And the same thing happens in accretion disks. Hotter accretion disks will be thicker, cooler accretion disks will be thinner. And in light with this radiation, we are essentially dealing often in accretion disks with weakly collisional plasmas, where essentially the electrons and ions can attain different temperatures. And since only the electrons can can cool efficiently, the ions will not always be able to lose their energy. So it's important to take this effect of the decoupling between the ions and electrons into account because it will lower the radiative efficiency and change the structure and dynamics of the accretion disk. Last but not least, you need to include general relativity because general relativity warps space time and the effect of this warping i think is best visualized in this numerical i mean an important effect of the warping i would say and that and maybe the one of the really important ones is precession here you see a numerical simulation of an accretion disk and jet in the middle you see an accretion disk here you see a jet again the axes are given in gravitational radii and in this case the black hole spin axis is pointing up and the disk is misaligned by 45 degrees with the black hole spin axis because of this of of this warping of space time you have an effect called lens fearing precession which causes this disk to precess like kind of like a spinning ball around the rotation around the spin axis of the black hole i will come back to precession later on in my talk so a very good way, I think, to model GRMHD uh, of model accretion is using GRMHD. GRMHD essentially is a grid-based method which solves conservation laws on a grid. So essentially you're saying that the change of a conserved quantity uh, over time is equal to the fluxes coming 
or escaping that particular cells, for example, conservation laws like the mass continuity equation, the energy momentum equation, the induction equation, the entropy equations for the ions and electrons are all included. GRMHD is very powerful because it can really take into account the nonlinear effects in the plasma and the radiation field. But it's much more expensive than semi-analytical models. So in many ways, uh, GRMHD is complementary to those because GRMHD often you have one or a few simulations and don't really understand the scalings and so on. One thing also that GRMHD can do is modeling everything on a global scale. So you have in a GRMH simulation, you've already seen it, you can model the accretion disk and black hole in one system. So you don't you know, need to have different models for accretion disks and jets. This comes at a cost, this globality. You are essentially not resolving all of the, you are essentially not resolving all of the dissipative scales, you also assume that the fluid is, uh, that, that the energy distribution of the particles is max value, and so the fluid is very collisional, while in fact often you have weakly collisional plasma around black holes. And these non-collision, uh, weakly collisionality effects can be modeled, for example, by particle in cell simulations on a smaller scales that on the one hand don't model the full scale of the system, but on the other hand, you can get more accurate data about the microphysics. So it's also complementary to all of these efforts in uh, complementary to all of these other efforts. Usually in GRMHD, we assume that essentially most of the physics is essentially uh, not really dependent on the mass of the black hole. So you can have very similar physics about, about both stellar mass and supermassive black holes. In fact, you have this gravitational radius, which is just approximately the radius of the black hole. And this, you know, just changes the time scale. So if you look at a supermassive black hole, the accretion disk will look very similar, but everything will be, for example, a million times bigger and everything will take a million times longer, but much of the physics is pretty well, uh, it's pretty well described in a scale invariant way. What is though very important in accretion, this is the mass accretion rate. So the rate at which gas falls into the black hole with respect to the Eddington ratio. When you have an Eddington ratio of one, it essentially implies that the radiation pressure is overcoming the gravity. In accretion, generally kind of simplified picture, but okay, you have two types of accretion disks. I call one of these disks Eddington rate, which means they are like more than maybe 1% of the Eddington mass accretion rate. And these disks are cool and thin because they can radiate their energy efficiently. And then you also have sub-Eddington disks, which are seen in other black hole accretion states where you essentially have this decoupling between ions and electrons and the cooling just becomes much less efficient and everything stays thick. So over the come over the past years and decades, GRMHD simulations were extremely successful in addressing black hole accretion in the limit where the disk is essentially far sub Eddington. That's Consistent with where we find most black holes, definitely most black holes in our universe are accreting at sub Eddington rate. Some of them have a substantial misalignment angle between their spin axis and the rotation axis of the black hole. That was addressed by some simulations, but typically most simulations assume alignment. However, if we kind of redistribute the data and look at accretion in a different way, then we essentially find that the few black holes that accrete close to the Eddington limit, limit might actually be responsible for most of the black hole feedback and growth. So essentially that very few black holes are responsible for most of the interesting action. And uh, this was not, 
really uh, addressed in the community and that's where my work comes in and this was not really addressed because it's not it's not not interesting it's just very hard because luminous accretion disks are very thin and that makes them very hard to resolve and because they are thinner also the accretion time becomes much longer for example if you want to simulate a disk which is 10 times thinner, you will pay 10 to 100,000 times, depending on how misaligned the system is in terms of computational power, which makes it very often prohibitively expensive to address these systems. What I am actually looking at the yellow, the pink, and blue. Oh, yes. So okay. the me, yellow let is the. Let me repeat the question so it's Yeah, so. Uh, you are asking what we are exactly looking at. So here in blue and green, we have the accretion disk. In red and yellow, we have the jet. And here, the accretion disk is uh, is blue. And this is an Eddington ray. Are those density contours? Yes, these are density contours. Yes, so this shows the disk. And it's just to illustrate that the disk in Eddington ray sources is much thinner than in uh, more like sub Eddington ray. Thanks for your question. Yes. So to address accretion in these luminous states, I've developed a new general relativistic MHD code, which uh, with the goal of making GRMHD much cheaper and more accessible. Uh, my code is called Hammer. It solves the radiator to temperature GRMHD equations, includes various optimizations, such as GPUs. GPUs are essentially processors used developed for gaming which are which are hard to program but they are extremely fast and are applied in more and more scientific areas that this like here you see in red how much speed up it gives in addition i mean of course five times six will not bring you directly in the regime of luminous accretion this i've also implemented algorithmic optimization such as adaptive mesh revival here you see just no context, this is just a fluid of some quantity, and I start running it. And what you, oops, something didn't go according to. Yes, now it started running. So now you see that essentially when the fluid moves, that the grid tracks the fluid, and that's essentially the idea of adaptive mesh environment and local adaptive time stepping, but in the temporal domain. You're essentially putting more computational effort in the regions where it's important and safe on the regions where it's not necessary or simply the regions in which you are not interested. In addition, Hammer also uses advanced grids that are really suited to studying black hole accretion. And all of this Hammer is really scalable to the largest GPU clusters in the world. I will give, uh, Greg invited me to give a talk on the 25th of February, where I will explain more about how Hammer was developed and what kind of and how these optimizations are implemented. Please that agree. Right? Hmm? That will be set. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yeah, please feel free to attend that the talk. So Hammer essentially it was funny, just started me and my supervisor developing a new code, but now. We're seven years further, Hammer has grown into something bigger, which I would call a collaboration. And really, it now spans six different groups on three continents. And all of us kind of share the same goal of not understanding accretion in just one state or one luminosity, but really understanding the global picture of accretion across multiple states and multiple systems and astrophysical context. In addition, it's also important, and that's what we started to do, to make observational predictions, because, you know, you need to test your theoretical models to see that they make sense. Otherwise, uh, it's otherwise you can just not draw strong conclusions, I think. And this is all supported by several grants now that I'm a PI or co in, like, ATP awards, inside awards on uh, on the summit, and also in Europe there is a very big supercomputer in Europe called Jules Booster that also some of the simulations I'm talking about are running at the moment. 
So the first problem I want to address in this talk is that I presented this picture of thin and fake accretion disk. And I can tell you now that it's not, it's not the entire story. That was not entirely correct what I was saying that all luminous accretion disks are thin. We actually know that some accretion disks which are luminous accrete close to the Eddington rate that simply the full accretion disk cannot account for all of the emission. We know there has to be really plasma called in corona, which is more than 1 billion degrees Kelvin hot. And yeah, essentially this corona works in the following way. You have in uh, a yellow, the accretion disk, this accretion disk emits like thermal photons and those get upscattered by constant scattering to higher frequencies. And that's in general what people think is happening, but no one knows how the corona looks like. There is lots of stuff. I just combined some stuff from a review article of what people think a corona might look like. It might be some blob of hot gas hovering around the black hole. It might be spherical. It might have other topologies. The bottom line is no one really knows what it looks like or how it works. Uh, it was postulated, uh, among others, by Mitch that magnetic flux might exactly that when the accretion disk is threaded by a significant amount of magnetic flux, that it might be a solution. So to address this theory, I've ran the first radiative simulations of an Eddington rate accretion disk, uh, which included also the decoupling between ions and electrons, where the disk was saturated by magnetic flux. Here in this plot, you see three plots. On the left, you have the density. On the, on the middle, you have the ion temperature. On the right, you have the electron temperature. In black are the field lines. In white is the jet wind boundary and in uh, purple you see the last scattering surface and uh, what you essentially yeah again radii are given in gravitational radius and what i also want to highlight is that the right hemisphere goes from zero to 10 rt while the left hemisphere always goes from uh, zero to 50 rt which is yeah then it's like this is like a zooming of that and what you essentially see that outside 20 rg i mean 20 rg is the radius until which the disk is saturated by magnetic flux that you see kind of an accretion disk it's pretty cool both in the ions and the electrons which have the same temperature because the ions and electrons are highly coupled through Coulomb collisions. While in the inner part, you see something. So within 20 RG, especially in the right hemisphere, you see something interesting happen. The gas is not anymore like 10 to the 7 Kelvin, but becomes extremely hot. Ions of uh, temperatures 10 to the 12 Kelvin and electrons almost reaching a billion Kelvin are re reached. And this is very close to what we expect to observe from a coronal plasma. And that is just purely due to the saturation of magnetic flux and, and most likely I think in connection in current sheets that are part of this corona. Uh, then there is another interesting thing that actually this corona, most of the volume is very hot plasma, like you see, but you see small like patches of cooler gas penetrating this corona, which penetrates through, I don't know exactly what Mitch made me doubt. I thought it was really, it were really tailored instabilities, but now I'm not entirely sure about that anymore. So some kind of to be determined plasma physical instabilities are causing this. And observationally, this is very interesting because we see broadened iron line emission, which of which is which is attributed to cold gas around the around the innermost stable circular orbits around black holes and such cold patches of gas penetrating the corona could exactly explain that observation in addition to the existence of the corona by itself and then also interestingly i've measured 
the outflows in this in in this simulation, and they reach extremely high efficiencies. The, the jet and winds have a combined efficiency of like order seventy percent, and the radiation does like twenty percent. So, one really important question in the transition from an accretion disk to a kind of coronal plasma is how this cold gas, which is which actually wants to cool and become even cooler and thinner, evaporates into very hot gas. And no one really knows the answer. What we have seen in these numerical simulations, we see some evidence, uh, we see evidence for current sheets. And these current sheets, they can in this plasma really heat up small portions of gas and really accelerate the respective ions and electrons to, among others, like really high energies. However, reconnection in GRMHD, we don't have any resistivity. So it's all numerical and all kind of depends on resolution. So maybe saying something you know, very strong about the reconnection rate or exactly which particles at which energies get accelerated in these GRMHD simulations is really hard. But there is one good thing that in uncertain regimes, when current sheets become long and thin enough, they break apart into magnetic islands, plasmoids called, which are essentially hot magnetized bubbles of gas. And if this happens, the reconnection rate essentially converges to a value, to, to a kind of reasonably well-determined value, I think, eventually. And however, these plasmoids were never observed in 3D GRMHD simulations. They were observed in some 2D work, but some in the communities were very skeptical and saying, yeah, the turbulence will break apart all current sheets and there will be no plasmoids at all And this story about plasmoids just doesn't make sense. So to address this, me and my collaborator, Bart Liperda, who visited here last week, have addressed this issue by running the largest GRMHD simulation ever in number of cells, 22 billion cells and 15 million time steps, where we really resolve the, the current sheet in such a way that it can become thin enough so that numerical diffusion doesn't artificially thicken this current sheet here. You see the end stage of this simulation on the left again is the density and on the right is the plasma beta, which is the gas over the magnetic pressure. In the plasma beta plot, you see a current sheet forming. You see the plasmoid highlights and you also see the field lines and the associated X point where we think the reconnection happens and where this gas really gets heated up and these non-thermal particles get created. So what is the origin of all this magnetic flux? Because really kind of all of this, you know, the current sheets, the coronal plasma really depend on the presence of large scale magnetic fields. And these large scale magnetic fields, we just insert them in the simulation. So you might ask, Aren't you just getting out of the simulation what you have put in in the first place? So to partially address this question, I ran a simulation which contained only toroidal, uh, toroidal large-scale toroidal magnetic flux with no colloidal components. Here you see the result again. Everything is density on the left. You have a zoom in of the right and. Magnetic field, poloidal magnetic field lines are given in black. There are no black lines because there is no poloidal magnetic flux in the initial conditions. But let's see when we start running the simulations. Suddenly, magnetic flux groups start to form due to something reminiscent of an alpha omega dynamo. So you have lifting of field, shearing, everything goes from toroidal to poloidal, back and forth. And after some time, very big <coughs> poloidal magnetic field groups start to form, which shows that you don't need poloidal magnetic field loops in the accretion disk to get them. And yeah, when accretion, when the turbulence kind of drags in the accretion disk and these poloidal magnetic field loops start to spread the black hole, which in this case is a white hole in my 
in my movie, then they lead to the launch of very powerful jets, which even exceed 100% of efficiency. So now I arrive at the second part of the talk where I'm talking about the variability in black hole, which is really interesting. For several decades, we see quasi-periodic pulsations in the light curves of black holes. They are there and no one really knows what they are. There are several types. The first big category are the low frequency quasi-periodic oscillations. Here you see essentially the power spectra, which have the frequency and the power of each of these fluctuations. There are several subtypes, type C, type B, and type A. Type Cs are often associated with the disk. Type A, B are, type Bs are associated with jet ejections. Well, no one knows what is happening with type A's. And they are typically between 0.1 and maybe 25 hertz. And they are very pronounced. In addition to low frequency QPOs, you also have high frequency QPOs, which yeah, the physical origin is unknown, but they happen at pretty high frequencies, like maybe 50 to 500 hertz. And really the long promise of QPOs is that such variability might encode aspects of, for ex of the system, such as the spin of the black hole, but also, for example, the structure of the accretion disk. So there is really a community-wide kind of desire to understand the physical origin because, you know, if you don't understand the QPOs, you cannot use them to measure or constrain anything. Several theories have been proposed for them. Uh, to name a few, uh, for example, orbital resonances between radio and vertical epicyclic frequencies, discoseismic pressure and gravity modes. The, uh, theory that I'm going to test is misalignment between the disk rotation and black hole spin axis and shows some promising results in the next slides. So to address if this misalignment can explain some low and possibly high frequency QPO, I've ran the largest GRMHD simulation ever. I think this GRMHD simulation is a little bit smaller in the number of cells than the simulation that we saw the plasmoids in 3D, but it's much longer. So it's definitely the most expensive one of the two. And here you see an accretion, like a luminous accretion disk, which is spin and misaligned by 65 degrees with the black hole spin axis at an extremely high resolution. This is the aspect ratio of the disk, and this is the black hole spin. Here you see essentially a transverse cut, like at, uh, at but what is it? The I equals zero plane of the density, and these are density contours. Uh, this all this high resolution really makes that even you know the disk looks very thin, but it's really the turbulence and the physics in it are really well resolved. So, oh yes, now it started running. So when I start running the simulation, you just see turbulence. The disk is turbulent, that's I think what you have seen before. But after some time, I think after like 40,000 RGO per C, the black hole, the lens fearing torque of the black hole pulls on the disk. And because the disk is so thin, the viscosity cannot up with this pulling. And you see that happening. This disk gets totally torn apart by this black hole and starts processing. So and so in processing disk forms self consistently in a numerical GRMHD simulation. This is the first demonstration of this effect. And this processing disk, you know, will emit radiation. And this radiation will be detectable. And the precession period, assuming this is a 10 solar mass black hole, would, would amount to 2.5 hertz, which is pretty consistent with what we see for low frequency QPOs. And that's very promising to explain such QPOs. This steering happens in cycles. So now you see a second cycle and you see many of these disks over the course of the of, of this simulation tearing apart and processing. And then the integrated light curve would show enhanced variability at this precession frequency is the current thinking. So the simulations I've shown were not in radiative 
GRMH today instead using a cooling function set an artificial temperature profile for the dish. So it's really hard to say how something like that would look like or what kind of radiation it would emit. To address that, I've restarted this simulation at half of the resolution in each dimension, but this time with radiation and temperature dynamics. And here you see again a volume rendering. Only here now you're not seeing a transverse slice, but a slice where we look down on the accretion disk. And this is the temperature. And very interestingly, this temperature uh, is really concentrated around. So the highest temperature can be found where the gap between the processing and inner processing and outer non processing disk is found. And in addition, we also see that there is an enhancement in radiation along a line which is 90 degrees perpendicular to the line of node. This is kind of this bluish region here in this accretion disk. And this is kind of, I think, for many people confusing because for years and decades we have assumed in emission models that, for example, were used to do spectral fitting to measure the spin of black holes and many other things that there is no as you would do dependence and essentially you have a radio power law temperature profile and we're still investigating the effects but the expectation is that this fundamentally can change how we should model black holes if indeed misalignment is an important effect so the next step of this is really shooting rays. So using ray tracing to make self-consistent light curves of these simulations. This is done by a collaborator of mine, Andrew West, at the Washington University in St. Louis. He's part of uh, Henrik Kravczynski's group. They have essentially taken the data of my simulations and ray trace it on the bottom. You see such a ray traced image together with again a volume rendering of the density contours. And he has made, Andrew has made an amazing movie that he sent me yesterday of how this processing disk that tears off would look like if you would look at it. And it looks really interesting, I say. Uh, that's not the only thing that he has done. He has also integrated the light curve and made a power spectrum because we kind of suspect that these low frequency QPOs can be explained by the precession of the disk. But we also know in sources there are high frequency QPOs. I didn't talk, I didn't prove anything about high frequency QPOs, but we can look at this power spectrum and see, just integrate everything and see if there is some peak in the power spectrum at a frequency roughly between 50 and 500 hertz and yes there is there is a very strong and significant peak at 56 hertz which we associate with a high frequency qpo and this is very robust besides that we've also dug a little bit in the data looking from different viewing angles and see if we can see evidence for more qpos for example in this case we are focused at the emission within 12 RG. And in addition to the 56 Hertz peak, that's everywhere very prominent. We also see some evidence of an 88 Hertz peak, which would form a three to two pair with the 56 peak and an 112 Hertz peak. But these two peaks, they are still under investigation. We're still not entirely sure if this is statistically significant. So stay tuned, but it indeed looks very promising. So what is the origin of this high frequency QPO? I've worked for that together with a uh, postdoc, Dr. Jip van Musoke at the University of Amsterdam. Here you see essentially the accretion disk again from a top-down view. So we are looking at this processing disk. And this is essentially the tear. This is, yeah, this is the inner processing disk. This is the tear between the inner and outer disk. And here is the outer disk. And when we run it, run the movie, if it starts, does it want to run? It does not really want to run. Ah, now, it, now it wants to run. We see this 
inner disc a little bit oscillating like a breathing mode. And then the question is, does this breathing mode or radial epicyclic oscillation or whatever explain this high frequency QPO? For that, we've looked at the density averaged radius of this disc for a time. And this is what we found. This is the time when this disc is precessing and this is the mass weight and radius of this inner disc and we see a very nice oscillation at 56 hertz, which also pops up in the associated power spectrum. So the conclusion is really that it is really this radial epicyclic oscillation. What people often ask me when I talk about precession of the disc, your simulations can also do jets. What about jets? Can jets precess? To address that a few years back, I ran a numerical simulation where essentially very similar in setup, but in this case, it was spread with a large scale colloidal magnetic field, which when it accretes onto the black hole leads to the launch of this powerful jet. Again, 65 degrees misaligned in the green and blue, you have the gas and in red, you have the jet. And let's see what happens. We see immediately that the jet, I mean, that the inner disk starts processing and the jet processes with the inner disk. And this needs to, and this, first of all, before I go to the really interesting part, this, uh, first of all, might explain QPOs associated with the jet at, let's say, frequencies like 2.5 hertz. And... In addition to that, we see very, I mean, you see it a little bit that the, that the jet and the disc interact very violently. And just because the magnetic energy density in the jet is so many orders of magnitude higher than typically than, than the rest mass energy of the gas in the jet, such collisions between the, let's say, the processing jet and the disc can lead to additional dissipation, which is really interesting because it can just, it might be able to accelerate, for example, cosmic rays and neutrinos to extreme energies, unattainable in particle accelerators on Earth. So how am I doing on time? I think I need to wrap up, so there will be no bonus this time. So to go to the conclusion, I think the most important part of this talk that I showed, I think like in the broader picture and for what you look in the future that we have arrived in a time that numerical simulations really can self consistently with radiation and to temperature to so address accretion in the luminous accretion state of black holes. As an example of what can be done, I've shown I think very, of course, lots needs to be done, lots needs to be verified about the corona, but I've shown a pathway of how such a corona might form or what it might look like. And that magnetic flux indeed, like for example, Mitch was proposing, plays a really important role in these luminous accretion disks. And in addition, I've also shown that when the disk is misaligned, that it will, it will, when the disc is luminous, thin, and misaligned, that the lens bearing torque will tear this disc apart and that it will lead to precession and interesting effects, and that these effects have profound observational implications and might form a solution to the QPO problem that has been lingering around. Then I, of course, come to the next step. What do we want to do next? I've constrained the morphology and the dynamics of many of these systems. And the next step will really be looking through other methods like particle in cell simulations or combined in a kinetic MHD form how all of these plasmas really dissipate energy and how really the microphysics works and how these microphysical processes really lead to the emission that we see across all wavelength bands. That will be, yeah, that will be the focus of my future research. Thanks for your attention and let me know if you have any questions. We have time for questions. Yeah. So, do you have the, the simulations that show uh, 
bleaching the physics, like, uh, and there are, there are like an evolution of some of the molecules in the paper that we did, or for the real I don't know if it's a crack, but it's the structure of the model. It's just too complex, and we're looking at this in vision, but I don't know what's going on. And it's, it's, it's lucky that we have to actually not only in this field, but in our field, to be able to identify this type of simulation. Yes, I mean, indeed. The yes, so essentially the bottom line is of the question is that uh, the simulations are very complex. Lots of stuff is happening in the simulations and essentially you don't always know what is responsible for what, what is the chicken, what is the egg, is that a little bit the sense, the, the call of your question, right? So yes, that's indeed analysis that's also something important now i think we've kind of looked at the basic you know physics of what might be happening for example the reconnecting current sheets but still there is so much work to do how for example this really leads to the heating of the plasma or for example i've presented this intuitive description of how this equation this tears apart and we are looking now really at, at analysis of the viscosity to really explain this processes that happen on a small scale in these simulations. So yes, besides running these simulations and getting the, how would you say, the phenomenology on which I focused in this, in this presentation, there is an extensive effort in the collaboration going on to really understand more in more detail the physical mechanisms behind what we all see. I have a zoom by way, but uh very related um, what was the explanation behind the tears of the face? So the explanation behind the tears <laughs> question. So I got asked what the explanation is behind the behind the tearing apart of the disc. What the explanation is you have the lens bearing torque which doesn't act on all radii the same. So different radii, if you have test particles in different orbits, they want to process at a different rate. But the viscosity keeps the disc together. And the disc, you know, the viscosity wants the whole disc to process at a fixed rate. Well, the lens bearing torque, you know, is, doesn't give you a fixed rate as function of radius. So what essentially happens is that the, let's say the inner disc in a very zero order model, the inner disk tries to process, the outer disk doesn't want to process, and this inner disk wants to drag the outer disk. That creates kind of a perturbation. And what you see that essentially is a function of the perturbation, the viscosity becomes smaller and smaller until the viscosity is totally gone. And that's the basic idea of this viscous warp instability that I measured. And then when there is no connection between the inner and outer disk, you just have this inner disk processing at its own rate. Does that answer your question a little bit? Um, yeah. So, uh, like, what does this space height of the disk have to do? For example, like you showed for a thin part, there is thin disk, in the thin disk, you observe the tearing on the disk. But if you take a thick disk, then they probably will not be any tearing. Yeah, the effect of viscosity, like in thick disks, is much more, they cover a much broader area and it's just much easier to transport you know, this torque in a thick accretion disk than it would be in a thin accretion disk. If I can add to that, uh, in a thick accretion disk, you actually get, um, oh, sorry. Um, and to add to that, in where is, oh, yeah, my, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's not me. Right. Um, is it coming through? Yeah. Um, it, uh, to add to that, if you have a really thick disk, uh, there are non, it's top, there are non axisymmetric pressure waves that go through the disk that actually transport angular momentum without the need for any viscosity. Yep. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Is there anything about the quasi-triatic oscillations that might be learned by analyzing the solar flares on very, very different scales? Um, yeah. So the question is if there are analogies between QPOs and solar flares in this case, I think, you know, solar flares just happen kind of 
you know, at the surface of the sun. I'm not really sure there would be really at one point, you know, a well-defined frequency which, with which they would happen, that you would have, you know, a very broad range of, you know, locations, sizes, frequencies. I'm not really sure about, I'm not a sort of that expert that that's kind of my gut feeling. Well, within solar flares, there are very often like different types of heat modes. So within one solar flare, then we get a repeating oscillation of some period based on like that agreement action properties and the environment. I was just wondering, because there's a lot of modeling work that's being done there, and so it just crossed my mind. Yeah, I mean, in this model of QPOs, no, because this is purely a geometrical effect. And, you know, there is no reconnection involved in any of these QPOs that I'm seeing, in the, at least in the process of, of tearing the disk apart and then causing this radio epicyclic the cost Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's uh, like an effect on the corona when the pollution is <coughs> That's a really good question. That's essentially why we are asking for this. So, so actually I need to repeat for the people on Zoom. If there, if there is any effect of the, of, of the disc tearing on the corona, and the question of that is we are now in the process of writing a proposal to ask a lot of computational time for that. So that's hopefully we will figure that out soon. Questions? Um, so I can ask a question. Uh, sure. It's actually sort of related to the last question. Is uh, uh, the uh, radiative signature of these QPOs is not achromatic. It's not, it, the QPOs tend to be primarily in the hard part of the yeah, spectrum. Exactly. So, do you have any uh, insight yet uh, as to as to why that is? Can your simulations explain that? Uh, I mean, they can explain, maybe I can go back a little bit to make my point. <laughs> oh, yes. So to, so, to repeat, so to repeat Mitch's question, the problem in observations of QPOs is that actually the QPO is not associated with an, like thin accretion disk, but often it's associated with plasma, which is hotter than the disk, much hotter than the disk. And if my simu and then the question is if my simulations can explain that and what we see essentially, I mean, first of all, of course, you could get an processing corona and that would solve your question. But in this simulation, because I mean there are no large scale magnetic flux, so there is not a corona that's presented. So this would be maybe a system for the experts in the soft intermediate state. What we do see though, we see these very strong like shocks along the line of nodes and this can arguably lead to some acceleration of and some non-thermal emission. What exactly the effect is if it would fully explain, for example, this hardening in the soft intermediate states, that's a question that I plan to answer, but it's a very good and interesting question. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's a question about uh, the policy of the recession. Yes. That's just a misalignment. So if you, I mean, if repeat the question. So, <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, so what is, uh, the, the question is, what is the origin of this procession? It's just the land spheric torque of the black hole. When you have, um, when you have, let's say you have an infinitesimally small particle orbiting around a spinning black hole and this orbit, you know, the orbital axis is misaligned with the spin axis of the black hole and you will see that general relativity will typically give you that this line of nodes will start to process. So it's an effect from general relativity. Yes. From the, let's say, from the warping of space time by the black hole in this case. Of course, you can have other torques, you know, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the supermassive black hole binary that can cause precession, but that's not the case in this simulation. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's thank you, Matthew, once again. Thank you. Yeah.